Welcome to the Broncos podcast with Troy Rank. I am your host, Troy Rank, from the Denver Post. This is most certainly not a victory Monday. More like depressing Monday. The Broncos absolutely got punched in the face by the Chargers. Do not let that score fool you of 23-16. It is not indicative of how much the Chargers dominated that game for 50 of the 60 minutes. Broncos got some empty calories on offense over the last 10 minutes. And you know what? Maybe they can use that as momentum in their own locker room. I'm not big on praising professional sports teams for not quitting. Maybe it's because I covered the Rockies for 15 consecutive years, and it gets old when you want Capri Suns and Orange Slices for trying hard. This is pro sports, boys. And they got their ass kicked for 50 minutes. It was 20 nothing at halftime. They got booed off the field by the sellout crowd. Understandably so. And two things happened in this game that we're going to highlight, and then we're going to look forward um, about uh, New Orleans. The prodigal son, Sean Payton, returning to New Orleans in his first game to coach against his former team, the New Orleans Saints, who thankfully the Broncos, for the Broncos, are also reeling after giving up 51 points to the Bucs, including 27 after halftime. They're in a bad spot defensively. They're dealing with injuries, as are the Broncos. But this one was disappointing. It's not devastating. <clears throat> Excuse me, because at 3-3, three and three, most people would have taken that to start the season. I've said in the podcast on Friday – of those three games coming up after the Raiders, you need to win two of three. Well, now you need to win two straight. And I didn't think they were capable of winning six straight. I thought they'd beat the Chargers, lose to the Saints, and then beat the Panthers. Now the path is beat the Saints, beat the Panthers. There's two winnable games. The Broncos have played well on the road. Saints are struggling, and Panthers stink. But the Broncos have issues to address. And it's almost going to have to be philosophically because on a Thursday bye week, folks, they don't really practice. It's basically walk through, walk through, get on a plane, and go play. So it's going to have to be a philosophical adjustment, specifically offensively, but also in the mentality defensively because it's very unlikely, highly unlikely, that Pat Sertan will be cleared to play uh, because of the number of the hurdles that are required to leap in the protocol. To clear by Thursday would be a surprise. It's not written that you can't play on Thursday with a concussion on Sunday. It's just the number of steps required make it almost impossible for you to be cleared. So defense has to adjust to life after and be ready for life after Pats or Tan for one more game. And the offense, maybe they play the Rolling Stones, start me up. Maybe they play let's get this party started. They got to figure something out because the way they are starting these games in the first half is bordering on incompetent and it is clearly embarrassing. And can they change that? They got a chance. New England's not good. Broncos still have everything in front of them, but man, did they get a brutal reminder? Clock ahead by the Chargers. We'll look back and then look forward after the break. Have you been injured in a car wreck or hurt at work? What are you waiting for? Give my friends at Hoggett Injury Law a call. Their motto with us, it's personal. Known Darby Hoggett forever. He's told me, Troy, do a Broncos podcast. I'm so happy he did. I became good friends with Darby. I've known him. Many of his clients have become his good friends. You don't even have to pay Darby up front. If your case goes as planned, Darby will be the one writing checks to you. So, again, if you've been hurt in a car wreck or injured at work, give Darby's team a call at one 833 H O double G A T T. That's one eight three three Hoggett, or visit the website at hoggettlaw.com. <clears throat> Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything sports betting. Every stat, matchup breakdown, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during games. With the largest catalog of odds on everything from football, MLB playoffs, NHL, NBA to political props. When the game's over, head over to their online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker. Maybe unwind with one of their 150 slot games. Head to the website today to get in on the action with America's most trusted site for online wagering. Bet online. The game starts here. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Broncos Pod with Troy Rink. I'm your host, Troy Rank from Denver, uh, Denver 7. Those days are over. I don't wear makeup anymore from the Denver Post. I had a coughing fit before I came on here with Big A to do the pod. I uh, thought I was going to 
fall down the stairs. I was coughing so hard, my ribs. That's how I just, I don't do any kind of crunches anymore. Apparently I just get into a coughing fit. So it feels like my ribs are going to explode. But I practically had tears in my eyes because I was coughing so hard. But then I was like, wait, on my phone, there's some Broncos first half highlights. Maybe that's why I'm crying. <laughs> it was so bad, folks. I mean, it is so bad in this first half. And I, I don't want to hear Chargers defense is good. I, I don't want to hear any of that. I don't want to hear it. This game spun on two things. The first pass by Bo Nix throws an interception. It happens. He's a young guy. Context is required. We talk about that on the show all the time. But this one hurt because it was a clean pocket. Marvin Mims, by NFL standards, was wide open. And Bo just mechanically, his feet sometimes, it's like a pitcher. He doesn't stay square. The shoulder's not. And it lets it flies on him, and he gets picked. First pass. And then the first play by the Chargers, Pat Sardan whips the ball carrier around, and in the process, he ha- he whips it, and then he slams his own head to the turf, giving himself a, a, uh, essentially whiplash, and he ends up with a concussion. And I knew right away because he went right down and grabbed his head, and it's just you know having played football, you know for several years, my sons played football. <clears throat> One of the worst things is when you fall and you slam your head back. Because we always want to see a concussion as direct crown of the head, get hit. But sometimes the worst ones are when you snap your head back, not unlike essentially what you see in a car wreck or in an accident. He stood down he, and he got up and he was holding his head. You can tell it wasn't right. He exits, goes to the locker room, doesn't come back with a concussion. And from that point, they get outscored 20 to nothing in the first half. And Bo Nix, some of these first quarter stats, and this is what it's like, Opponents can't stand Pat, and the Broncos prove they cannot stand without Pat. The defense changed, and I'll get into that in a second. But offensively, this was the moment that you say, you know what, we're going to carry our weight. They have been riding along during this three-game winning streak, other than like a quarter against the Raiders, not really doing their part. The defense, we talk about, they were holding teams to drive touchdowns where like 12% of drives were ending up in touchdowns. 11 points per game during the winning streak. That's not sustainable, folks. That's not sustainable. So you needed the offense to step up. And right when Sertan goes down, that's when you need the offense to punch back, counterpunch. Our best guy's out. We're going to show you we can win in a different way. And instead, it just you could feel the air leave the balloon. Offensively in the first half, and, and Parker Gabriel, my partner at the Denver Post, has some of these stats I want to read read from his story. But, I mean, remember that Bo Nix was 4 for 14 for 27 yards entering the fourth quarter. So let's understand how bad it was. I don't. He ended up with 216 yards passing, 61 yards rushing. 253 of his 277 yards were in the second half. And 189 yards passing were in the fourth quarter. So miss me with it was a good game. Now, if you had him on your fantasy team, it was the ultimate Blake Bortles, Kyle Orton type of game of stat padding at the end because they got their ass kicked and those stats came when it it really didn't matter. If you want to say, well, if they get the onside kick at the end, fine, you can live in that world and drink that Kool-Aid. I'm not going to. I'm not going to because it was just such a dominating performance by the Chargers. But just listen to some of these stats the Broncos are dealing with in, in the first quarters of games that it's just hard to understand how they could be this bad where they're not helping the team out. At one point in the first half, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the first half, Broncos are down 20-0. The Chargers have 16 first downs. The Broncos at that point had run 20 plays. So not only are they bad, they're not even out there for to be mad at them because they can't even stay on the field. From the moment Sertan went down, the Broncos offense couldn't stay on the field. And the Broncos defense couldn't get off the field. In the first half, the Chargers, 8 for 10 on third down. They converted 11 of their first 14 third downs. Coming into the game, teams were in the during the win streak were right around like 25% against the Broncos on third down defensively. The Chargers threw out 11 for 14 to start the game. What? <laughs> what? I mean. In the fourth quarter, again, Broncos end up with 230 yards, Chargers at 29. But I give Sean Payton credit for this. Not much else in that game. 
Afterward, he said, listen, they were covering us differently. It's a totally different game. That's why those numbers the way they were. Good for him. Because in the in the media afterward, everyone's talking to these players like, oh, what a great comeback. Come on. I'm like, come on now. Come on now. Really? I mean, you're playing against a prevent defense. <clears throat> I mean, again, if you want to praise the Cortland Sutton touchdown, that was a hell of a catch. One of the best in the NFL this year. One-handed at the pylon. Remarkable. It was like a 46-yarder. Remarkable catch. And, and obviously, you tip your cap to Troy Franklin gets his first touchdown. But it was all – it felt garbage time. It just felt garbage time, and I, I'm not going to overreact to that. But I do think there's something you can learn from it. But you just look at this number. I want to read to you, and this is from my friend Parker Gabriel's article. If you take away the start against the Bucks, remember they had touchdowns on their first two possessions. The Broncos have had the ball 30 times and scored one touchdown and failed to get a first down 17 times in 30 first-half possessions. They've been shut out in the first half three times this year. Last year, what's funny is working off the script with Russell Wilson early in games, the Broncos were decent. And then they were the worst third-quarter team in football last year. They literally didn't score a touchdown in the third quarter. I think it was like all season. They finally broke it. They were terrible when they got off script. This year, on script early, they're awful. And then when Bo Nix runs around late, they've shown some promise. So what can we learn from this? And we, with the headlines there, no certain, no chance. And that is exactly what happened. But what can we learn from this? Sean Payton's going to have to continue to evolve with Bo Nix. I, I'm not, I believe they can fit. I do. But Sean Payton is going to really have to resist that gravitational pull, again, to coach the team he wants, not the team he has. He's never coached a rookie quarterback, and there are times that is very clear that he's trying to get something done with a quarterback that is inexperienced, and they're almost devoid of playmakers. For the love of God, trade for a T. Higgins or a tight end. I mean, they just don't have enough playmakers. But in absence of that, they're going to have to go a little more up-tempo. Bo's more comfortable in it. It's, it's what he did in college, both at Auburn and Oregon. They're going to have to go a little more up-tempo. Now people are like, why don't they just start that way? Obviously, you have to be careful with that because you go up-tempo, you can look back to Chip Kelly's days with the Eagles. You can't have 90-second drives back to back to back. It just Your defense has no chance. They can't be on the field that because ultimately they're gonna, the defense will end up facing like 90 plays. No chance. But a little bit of up-tempo sprinkled in is necessary for Bo Nix right now. And just continue to pare down these personnel changes. We don't need to see five and six new guys coming in every down. What are they adding? Like it's one thing in hockey when you do a line change and you bring in your top line to score. You bring in your PK unit. You bring in your power play group. You're just replacing mid with mid. Like at some point, just say, you stay out there. There's no upgrade coming from the bench. Do we need five new guys coming in? Because the if fewer personnel changes mean more time in the huddle and more time for Bo Nix at the line of scrimmage, which is a good thing for me because <clears throat> we see glimpses of it. But I, I just think they can have to continue to do more to help him. Sean Payton keeps talking about paint the picture, Shangri-La. we got to paint the picture for him and make everything around him easier. Well, right now he's hanging from the ceiling, you know, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. You're asking him to do too much. Simplify this. Less personnel changes, a little more up-tempo. It can't be consistent up-tempo because it'll kill the defense, which is the strength of your team by far. But if you look at this, can it be worse? I was telling Big A before we came on, I mean, the Broncos in the first half had seven possessions. You know how many times they got over midfield? Once. And then the next play, Javante Williams fumbled. That's why I'm saying how pathetic it was in the first half, and I don't want to hear about some comeback in the last five minutes of the fourth quarter. Good for the team. Good for the locker room. If you guys want to build on that, that's fine. As you know, reporters, columnists, fans, we don't have to fall for that banana in the tailpipe. It was awful. So you have to prove it to us. If you need that to convince yourself, that's fine. That didn't convince me of anything. Because that first half was embarrassing. You got absolutely punked in an AFC West game. And that's life against a Harbaugh team. I mean, Harbaugh didn't even see their first scoring drive because he was in the locker room. He had an irregular heartbeat, 
This is now the third time he's dealt with it since 1999. When he had it in 2012, he said, with uh, a game he coached with Colin Kaepernick. And he joked that during games now he's 2-0 and with an irregular heartbeat. I, I do wonder, he was asked this after the game, if he thought altitude affected it. And I, I'm certainly not a doctor. But did that play any role in him not wanting to coach in Denver? Beyond, you know, his Michigan team was great. He was going to win a national championship and did. But he wondered, did the altitude, altitude bother him? And he didn't know. I mean, he's not a doctor either. But Jim Harbaugh's team did exactly what we expected. They punched him in the mouth. 128 yards rushing. Broncos backs take out Bo Nix's incredible rushing yards late. Broncos backs, 11 carries, 44 yards. It's just not enough, folks. Javante Williams, is th they need an upgrade over Javante. They need a clear number one receiver, and they need a uh, pass catching tight end. To ask Bo Nix to try to make this work, he's not Caleb Williams, folks. He's not Jaden Daniels. There's a reason he was the last quarterback taken in the first round. He's not those guys. He does a lot of things well. He has confidence. He has swagger. He's smart. The experience, but athletically, arm strength. He's not. You know, they use a baseball scale, eighty on scouting scale. He's not an eighty with arm strength. He's not an eighty in those categories. So you got to help him out. They've got to get better players around him. But if there's no help coming, then they've got to design the scheme a little better, make it more friendly. I was talking to Nick Cosmider from the Athletic yesterday as we were walking out of the stadium, and he's he's dead right with this. We need to see a little more Auburn, Bo, and a little less Oregon. And what he's, we're saying is they're going to run a little more. There's a danger with injury. I get it. But <clears throat> this kid has been a running quarterback his entire life. He's shown an awareness and instinct to protect himself and get out of bounds and slide. So I think he can rush eight, ten times a game. He is their best rusher. He's led them in rushing all but two games. And I just think they need to incorporate some of this stuff sooner. Because every offensive player I talked to said, we can't start slow. We have to have more of a sense of urgency. Agree. And, like, we have to execute. Well, sometimes they can't execute. They've got to have the scheme execute for them. They're not good enough to just line up and win one-on-ones. And the offense was awful. And so after we talked to Cortland Sutton about what the, you know, that I, I was the first question, asking him about the slow start, what changed, and he talked about the game and the comeback and certainly his catch. He's remaining positive. He's a captain. That's his role. But here's what Cortland Sutton had to say about what was a pathetic start and then for the offense, an encouraging finish. You know, you never want to see one of your brothers go down. And, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's very, it was very unfortunate to, you know, because he's a huge part of the, not just the defense, but the team. You know, everyone looks for him. You know, he's obviously he's the captain of the team and everything. But, um, I, you know, I, <clears throat> I think that we just, you know, um, we just started out slow. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it was necessarily the fault of or a correlation of Pat being hurt. Yes, no one wants to see him get hurt and everybody wants to see him out there playing. But I think that we as a as a whole, we just started slow and and, and we put ourselves we dug ourselves into a hole that um, we we're going to have to do a lot of things really well in the second half to be able to get out of. And, um, I think the fight that we showed in the second half definitely says a lot about the character of this team. It's just we kind of, you know, just the, the slow start definitely hurt us. You know, us not us as offensive guys not being able to convert and stay on the field definitely hurt us. Um, I think that the the Chargers went out and they executed the the game plan that they wanted to execute. They wanted to be able to run the ball, affect the time possession, um, take the ball away, and we gave them two we gave them two turnovers, which ultimately you know didn't help us in terms of time possession. And it played into the hand of what they wanted to do, and that's that's stuff that we can control. Um, you know, the the time, the untimely penalties. Uh, we have big plays, and and certain and and you know, it gets those plays get negated because of a penalty. Those are things that you know, those are all things that we can control, and um, it's on us. You know, at, at the end of the day, it's on us to to get those corrected. And I think that the second half, we found a, a really good stride in. Um, very encouraging, very encouraging because of how the second half went. I think that it showed, like I said, a lot about the character of this team and and the heart. Gordon, a lot of guys will talk about they don't. There's no quit in a team. There's no quit in a player. But you guys have shown that, and this isn't the first time this season you've proven that. Yeah, um, I think that you know I've, I've spoken to this, uh, uh, you know, a lot, and I remember I don't remember who exactly asked me that question, 
but after Pittsburgh, someone asked me a question. I thought it was the most bizarre question, but they asked me, why do you feel like, you know, you guys are going to be able to figure this out and turn it around? And I told them, because I see these, I see the work that these guys put in. I see the, I see the determination and the way that these guys, you know, come to work every day, the way they go and prep, get ready for the games and the way they go out there and play. And when you see that and you know the, you know the character of each player, you know that you're going to be able to, you know, have success. And I think that we've proven it, you know, week in and week out that there's no quitting this team. Down 23 nothing, going into halftime. It was, e it, it could have been easy for us to lay down and, you know, say, oh, they got us today. But nah, we went out there and we put our best foot forward in that second half and came up a little short, but that, those are the sins from the first half. And that's something that we can address. And that's something that things that we can, that we can fix. Um, however, that, that second half showed everything that we needed to know about this team and that there's no quit. Everybody's going to continue to battle, continue to fight until the clock has four zeros on it. I tell the guys all the time, they're going to get everything I got the entire the, the entire game until it says zero, 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 whatever it may be. And I know that, it's a, that every guy in this locker room believes that same way. And when you got a group of guys that believes like that, you can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. That may, not have been, that may not have been your toughest touchdown catch, but it was high in degree of difficulty. Can you take us through it? Um, yeah, I mean, shoots. We needed a play. We 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 needed to find. We needed a spark. We needed a, needed something to to go well for us to be able to get a you know get the juice back going on, on our sideline and um, you know, Bo gave me an opportunity, gave me a chance to make a play, and um, I was able to come down with it. I knew that I caught it, but you know, it's. When you get them replays going and you get a whole bunch of other opinions upstairs, you know, who knows what can happen. So I'm glad that them boys didn't try to overturn the call that was made on the field. But um, we just needed some juice, man. We needed we needed a play to happen. We needed somebody to make a play. And we always go to each other on the sideline. It was like, hey, hey you know, you never know who it's going to be, but the ball's going to find you. You just got to be ready to go make a play. And the ball found me and I was able to make a play. And like I said, we came, or unfortunately came, came a little short today, but... On to the next one. Hey, Clark, what you Thanks, Cortland. Cool. Thank you, guys. Yeah, listen, Cortland Sutton is a captain. So for him to have a positive view, glass half full, totally understand it. I've coached. I've played. You know, his job in that locker room, he was walking around to guys in the locker room afterward talking about, hey, here's what we did, and, you know, encouraging guys. I respect that. He's shown humility this year. He's shown real leadership. Um, even in front of us, it used to, you know, when I'd ask teammates to say before, it was more behind the scenes. But that was not a good game. I mean, it just wasn't. And, you know, trying to, in the press, you know, praise them for trying hard. I mean, at some point, you, you hold the team accountable to turning the corner. And part of the – when the athletes don't understand, when we ask, like, what about this group makes you think they can bounce back, is the context. They haven't been in the playoffs since 2015. They haven't had a winning season since 2016. So there is this sense, like, what makes this team different? And when I've covered the team I've, during this entire time, since 2014 now through this season, the Broncos' standard for excellence has changed. And a lot of these players, none of them know how to win. They don't know what it looks like. It doesn't mean there aren't winning players on the roster. But as a group, they've never won together. And a lot of these guys – like Garrett Bowles, like Cortland Sutton, guys who've been here a long time, they've never even been close to winning. So that's why, you know, those questions get out. Like, what about this group's different? And, and Riley Moss said it. I give Riley Moss credit. He kept it real after the game, saying it was a dark cloud after Sertan went down. We didn't handle adversity well. It was our problem. Uh, it took too long to kind of shake out of the funk that we were in without Pat. And we got in the locker room down 20 nothing, and we looked at each other and we were just like, hey, we can't basically go out like this. We're better than this. We're not going to be the team we've been in the past. That's real talk. Can you now go prove it? We'll see. But that's a guy being honest and understanding. The reason you're getting these questions is because every time you've had a chance to fold, you have. So why would I give you the benefit of the doubt that you're different when you haven't shown me you are? This has been an encouraging start at three and three, and you can make it really promising at five and three. But if you go and get your ass handed to you by New Orleans in prime time, and then squeak by the Panthers in four and four with upcoming road games at Baltimore and Kansas City, 
Then you're staring at four and six, and then how do you expect everyone else to feel it's different? You know, if you want the smoke, some of these guys want more smoke than Santa Claus going down the chimney. Then you have to take the questions of when you play like crap. And they did. It happens. But the way out is then just to show it and say, you know what? It was an anomaly. We have been making progress. We've played complimentary football. Now we can do it. But it really, folks, it comes down to this. They've got to play better offensively. You cannot win football games scoring 13, 14 points a game and being one of the worst first-half teams. You can't do it. Now, again, New Orleans stinks. They just gave up the most points they've given up since 2012. So it offers an opportunity. So I want to get into that after the break, the, the homecoming of Sean Payton and how this represents a get-right game for both teams, which makes it dangerous, but really an opportunity for the Broncos to get this season right back on the rails. We'll get to that after the break. You know what? You want to enhance your home. You want to make it look nice. Glass doors, they can help. And that's where Jamie Hay comes in. He and his wife, Lisa, run RBJ Glass. It's a family business. They pride themselves on customer service, honesty, and integrity. They put a sliding glass door in our house. We absolutely love it. Listen, at RBJ, they have competitive prices and offer discounts to veterans, senior citizens, and have even accommodated single parents. They do mirrors, window glass replacement, insulated doggy doors, office cubicles, and small commercial storefront. So what are you waiting for? Give Jamie a call. It's Jamie of RBJ Glass at 720-883-3144, 720-883-3144, or email Jamie at rbjglass2017 at gmail.com. Folks, thanks for listening from wherever you are. I really appreciate it. I know today stings. It hurts. If you were at the game, you might have been booing. You at least saw a little bit of scoring late. But it was a tough game. It was a tough watch. But now the Broncos go to New Orleans. And New Orleans was the, the, the talk of the NFL after their first two games, averaging almost 50 points a game. Clint Kubiak, you all know the Kubiak family. Clint Kubiak went to Regis, played at CSU. Good dude. He's the offensive coordinator. He's helped revive them offensively, even now with Spen uh, Spencer Rattler, the kid from uh, South Carolina via Oklahoma as their starting quarterback, the rookie. They scored 27 points yesterday and were not competitive. <laughs> they were up 27-24 and allowed 27 consecutive points to lose 51-27. to 27. They've been boat raced their last few games. They are vulnerable defensively. And I don't know that it ended particularly well with Dennis Allen and Sean Payton. Dennis Allen took over when Sean Payton left. It just doesn't feel like it was a great ending. And, you know, if you talk to some people who wondered if Sean Payton wanted to come back after his one-year absence and go right back to New Orleans, they weren't having that. Uh, so he ends up in Denver. But, again, I, I'm sure he gets along with Allen. I just It felt awkward when Allen took over and then that year off and Allen not doing great, and then here we are again. It's a big game for both of them. Before the season, most people picked Dennis Allen to be the first coach fired. Then they got off to that great start. Now they're playing a little bit, you know, regressing to the mean, the Broncos are about where we expected, three and three. Their rent, I didn't expect them to win two in a row in the road, but I had them right around this number. I had them at four and four going into those two games at Baltimore and Kansas City. Five and three would give them a chance to be competitive all the way through the year. It really could. But what do they have to do? Folks, they've got to be competitive early offensively. And this is who Sean Payton is. If you look at his Saints teams, they were one of the most prolific offenses for 15 years in the history of the NFL, from either first with Breeze to top five. And, yes, the talent was better with Kamara, with Darren Sproles, with Ingram, with Jimmy Graham, Michael Thomas. Go down the list. Broncos could use one of those guys. And Sean Payton needs to go there, and he's going to say it's not a big deal. He just gets another game. It's not. He is – if not the prodigal son, he certainly helped put New Orleans Saints football, not on the map, give them an identity. Because before he got there, their identity was Archie Manning and fans with bags over their heads. And in a time of Hurricane Katrina, his team in 06 gave that city hope. And they, you know, win 10 games, the Steve Gleason block punt. It changed the, the feeling of the city. 
and then a few years later they win a Super Bowl. So let's let's not diminish what Sean Payton and his coaching staff and what those Saints teams meant to New Orleans. But he also had three years where he went like seven and nine in a row. He, he won nine. He went to the playoffs nine times. He only got to the Super Bowl once when people thought they should have probably been back at least twice, if not three times. I mean, I'll give them this. They got jobbed against the Rams. The Super Bowl, the Rams ended up losing to the Patriots. That They got completely screwed on an interference call. They should have won that game and gone to that Super Bowl. Then the year with Tom Brady in 2020, they got waxed at home after just crushing uh, the Bucks during the season. So, but you cannot discount what Sean Payton did there. Almost, you know, 150 wins, the nine playoff bursts, the Super Bowl title, because that was an organization that it was just defined by losing. If you're, if you're as of my age, and grew up watching NFL films. I mean, the, the those yearly highlight films of the Saints. It's like George Rogers and Archie Manning, and then fans with bags over their heads. I mean, it was just ugly, ugly history until Peyton got there. So he can say it's not. It's a big deal for him to go back. And we're going to talk to him today here at 10 a.m. this morning. So I'll have more on that, uh, and then another a, a pod Friday morning after the game. But. It's a big deal. No matter what he says, it's a big deal given who he was there, what his teams did there. But for Peyton, it's also a crossroads game. He has got to get this Broncos offense going and evolving, and they have to start faster. Because against New Orleans, a good def- a good offense, even with Spencer Rattler, you let them get out on you 17 to 3, 14 to nothing. You're not going to win that road game with this offense. You're not. You can keep it close. You can keep it 10-10. You can get a lead. The Broncos defense can stand up and win that game against a rookie. But but you've got to give your defense a chance by staying on the field offensively, allowing it to be a close game or with a lead so you can get that pressure, and having a you know time to at least adjust mentally without Pat Sertan. I think you'll see him blitz a little more. What it did is it moved Jaquan McMillan out of the slot to the outside. Levi Wallace came in. You had Key then coming in the dime packages. But because Pat was out, you couldn't play man as much with Moss, McMillan, and Pat. So now you're playing more zone coverage, and you're not getting – you can't blitz. You can't safety blitz as much. It just felt like they were neutered defensively. Now you have a week kind of mentally to get your – basically your mind around it that you're probably not going to have your best player defensively. Now we're prepared. It's not an in-game adjustment. Now we're prepared for this. No excuses. Saints are vulnerable. They're starting a rookie quarterback. It's time for the Broncos offense to evolve, use some up-tempo, fewer personnel changes, and it's time for the defense to get after a rookie quarterback and get this kind of season back on track. It all sets up for a huge Thursday night. It's going to be fun. I will be in New Orleans starting Wednesday morning. I'm looking forward to it. Always a good trip there. Broncos country, I can't thank you enough for this, and I can't do the show without my sponsors of Mile High Sports and Nate Lundy and Big A behind the screen. He had a tough day. CU loses, his Cowboys lose, and his Mets lose. It's going to get better, right? It's going to get better. I promise. It can't get worse in the Broncos where we're struggling to keep us awake on Sunday. But I couldn't do this without my eye sports, RBJ Glass and Jamie Haig, uh, Bet Online, and of course my man Darby Hoggett from Hoggett Injury Law. Broncos country, I do this pod for you. Happiness that begins with me. Go out there and have a great day.